I followed a lot of uh, a lot of folks in California's footsteps when in the fact that I discovered yoga on a beach. It was just like an open class. Um, I was in the I was in the process of going through recovery um, from from a heroin addiction. So yoga was just all all, all part of that story and. Um, and I think the most more important part was that I felt what it was like to be in my body and then seeing and was so fascinated that there was a structure, like a structure, a structural way of getting into that embodiment. And so I did my teacher, I, I practiced for pretty much my entire time in San Diego. Um, I start, I started off going to studios. I started off with a primarily Iyengar base uh, studio and then moved on to the place that I did my teacher training was primarily uh, first in, t- again, Iyengar, but specifically on Usara. And, um, and they were very forward with Tantra. At what point or in what way did you decide to become trained as a teacher? Like, is that, I, I think that's, I don't know how common that is. It seems like a lot of people I know who get super into yoga do teacher training, but like, it still seems like a big step. What made mm-hmm. you want to take that step? Um, it was, it was a lot of encouragement from my teachers that I was, I would regularly be taking their classes. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy being a teacher's pet. So I was, I would often be like the, uh, one of the favorites of the teachers, um, but unfor- unfortunately, though, it's not, as, at least in California, and I, I'll have to always remember that things are a little different uh, when you kind of move away from the yoga capital. But um, in, in California, it, leading a teacher training along with doing retreats are probably the only viable ways that somebody could potentially work full time as a um, yoga teacher. So unfortunately, it, it's not that it's not that I think it's bad that we have so there's a huge influx of yoga teachers, um, but I think that they're sort of being misled and misled into thinking that it's going to be a very clear path to become a teacher, especially in a, an area where it's the it's just incredibly oversaturated. Like you go away from Southern California, and the type of access you have to yoga completely changes like immense, immensely like in in um in southern california i could be like oh i want to go practice some kundalini today so i'm going to go to my uh one of my teachers houses at like three in the morning for sadhana or if i want if i want some ashtanga there's somebody doing an ashtanga um my source style practice in their garage like it, it's just there's so much of it and then coming and now i'm on the east coast now and i have yet to see any studio that does anything more than some sort of hot power yoga so the i think i do i do find that it's really beautiful that taking part in a teacher training actually just is so immensely helpful for cultivating one's own personal practice but then yeah it's um it it's an industry there (laughs) Uh it's extremely tempting to go into the astrology industry parallels that I can sense there, not in terms Mm -hmm. of the geography so much, but like in terms of the kind of gold rush of training more and more teachers as like a lucrative thing. But what I want to talk about yoga, I want to hear about what teaching was like for you, which you did for a period of time. And Mm -hmm. it it sounds like you, you had some fairly interesting experiences as a yoga teacher. Um, how was that period and how long were you doing that for? Oh man. So I was teaching from basically from, uh, 2018 until now, 2023. Um, and also being kind of swept up in the like big, like rush of new teachers. I was actually really lucky. I was actually really lucky though, that I actually got hired by, um, a friend had recommended me to work for this big corporation that supply that, um, provides health, health and wellness services to many big corporations like like sony um hmm. <clears throat> another place in, Los, in san diego was like qualcomm so i was primarily teaching for them and for me what i had wanted to do was to help people understand what yoga actually was and what they were actually doing so i ran into quite i ran into quite a bit of um resistance from 
from other from other people it was really nice it, it was really nice being able to um cultivate one-on-one -on -one relationships um but i my class because i was i was trying to teach a less glamorous kind of yoga my classes weren't weren't the most popular hmm. within that within that corporate setting so it sounds like the tension was between just like a physical exercise or something that people were seeking and like a mm -hmm. spiritual practice or something mm -hmm. that you wanted to convey does that sound yes. accurate 100%. And when I first initially began, I was very gung ho about um, very unyielding about just wanting to do this, um, teach the folks on like this, the gifts that one can obtain from just following, you know, the d directions laid out by Patanjali. Um, but as I began, to, as I began to learn more, like I've, I learned that Iyengar, when he was originally trying to disseminate yoga into the West and he started off in, in the UK, they told him that he was allowed to teach yoga as long as he made no mention of anything yoga had to do with India culturally, wow. but he was allowed to purely teach it from just a very physical, um, with a physical just a physical focused sensibility so it so about after learning that because one of the main things that kept going through my mind was you know this, what is the right way of teaching yoga and am i doing it the right way but then having to learn learning the history and finding that it is actually there there is real it's just such a um diverse kind of practice you have so and this is just like a tradition that's just been following yoga for a very long time um, so I had to, so teaching was, was difficult because I had to learn how to, how should I say this, simplify the message mm -hmm. and simplify the, the messages that the yoga had to offer into just in a very physical way. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm very interested in sort of what the resistance that you encountered to that was like. E yeah, it was the, well, it, the main thing was class attendance. It's just uh -huh. that I had a very small group of like very devoted regulars, but that was about it. Like uh -huh. on the, I would, it was just sort of, it just wasn't across people's minds. Mm -hmm. uh, people wanted, wanted to feel physically good. They wanted to sweat. They wanted to have the, they wanted to sculpt their body um, through the yoga. And oftentimes my classes, we would be, we wouldn't be focusing on trying to get into inversions or doing some of the more rigorous um, and skillful techniques just simply because I didn't think most people I was teaching within that sitting were even physically ready to do any of those things. <laughs> like out of the eight years I taught um, at this corporate setting, I only had one regular who I felt comfortable showing her how to do inversions. Mm. How did it get to that point? Like that, that's, it's interesting that like these are techniques that you're, that you're practiced in but it, it wasn't, and it was what people were demanding, but they weren't ready. Like how, what, what was different about this person? They, they actually, they listened. Um, well, they were one, they were, they actually were physical. They had a very physical practice already. So they weren't, they weren't seeking me out to fill that vacancy in their life. Whereas a lot of people who were coming into my classes, um, one thing that was really special is I actually got to work with a lot of different types of bodies. Um, so be, figuring out how to make classes accessible was also very difficult. Like I would have in one corner, somebody who was just um, like Gumby. And then on the other hand, I had somebody who had severe mobility issues and I had to teach them in this like hour in this hour setting, but at the same time. Mm. So um yeah, and my regular, this regular, one of my one of favorite students of mine, just kept coming to my classes and was very interested in the spiritual concepts that I would sprinkle throughout my classes. Yeah, so the so the yeah the resistance was just basically a lack of recep re reception, and then when I would amp up the physical demand of the class, I would get also pushback because then it would be too difficult for people. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Couldn't win. Yeah, it, it was if it, it really felt like that. And I felt that the problem was not so much whether the class was hard enough or easy enough. It was because of my focus and that I wanted to I, I wanted to really teach a yoga that was going to be uh, less about the physical rewards and more about be as a stepping stone to cultivate an actual spiritual practice. Mm. I, I want to go back to to what that means to you by way of 
bringing back the thing you said about simplifying the message, which I mm-hmm. feel is like reflects a real wisdom in a practice for someone to realize that as, as you're working with other people in this practice, that like there is something that is not connecting and that it's actually your job in the middle to translate, not just force the message on them, uh, but, but to, to make a connection somehow. I'm really interested in uh, what the simple version of the message is that you came to. So I literally have, I, th- I will literally recite the second, um, the second, um, I'm trying to figure out what you call it, like the second verse of the Yoga Sutras, uh-huh. but to my classes, oh, like the first two, three uh, verses over and over again, because a lot of people don't even, don't even know that what, what they're doing in yoga and the verses yoga, chitta, vritti, niroda, which is yoga is to restrict the movements of the mind. Hmm. And it's, and I just lay that out very simply to people. And a lot of people have come to me after like the class after class and they have like just remarked on, wow, I had no idea that was yoga just so clearly laid out. So most people aren't even aware of like the very, at least in the classical traditions, like the, like the, why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So then, and then further, then we would further break what I attempted to do, which I didn't get a lot of reception or maybe it was wrong place, wrong time. But, um, uh, why, you know, why are we doing the physical things that we're doing? Like what, why do they matter within the structure of a class? And just sort of trying to uh, break these things down to people. Like another one, I would we would often talk about is um, meditation and how Patanjali, in the way he's compiled the sutras, seems to focus specifically on focus. So as opposed to like something like um, vipassana, this was one like one could if one could hone their focus into a pin prick, and then point that towards something that is worth focusing on, then that is essentially like what they're going to get so much more out of the practice. So as, and this, and it was, and it was just so much of these, um, trying to break, uh, trying to break down these bigger spiritual concepts into very simple, actionable things was the uh, challenge that I would often have to go through. Can you tell me about your early experiences, having that experience for yourself? For me, it, it happened. It happened very, very organically. Um, even in my first class, like when I was sitting there, you know, I, I I had to learn about the way that my mind likes to talk while I do things. And Relatable. for me personally, it, it one thing one hurdle I had to go over was that I didn't have a lot of random thoughts about like what I was going to do for that day. You know, it's like if I'm in Adho Mukha Svanasana, I'm not saying they're thinking like, oh, have I paid my bills <laughs> and all these other things, or ooh, that person's pretty. Do they like me? And it was more the I was already ve- I'm already very self critical, so I'm running through the uh, cues that the teacher would give. Uh, but then I noticed I actually started noticing how that in itself was the way that my mind kept itself dis- the dis- how the disconnection was um, sustained within my mind. Mm-hmm. It was through that onslaught of self criticism during mm-hmm. my classes. Mm-hmm. How did that change for you as your practice progressed? well or did it i i mean it's kind of it's still it gets kind of progressed but Mm -hmm. i wouldn't say i I think i've budged it Mm. after years Mm -hmm. it's just moved slightly now but no it's still very much a challenge Mm. and it happens in everything i do like even if i'm doing a seated practice like 90 percent of the thoughts is oh i need to tuck my tailbone i need to get the curves of my spine right i need to move my shoulders back i have to align my head non-stop in my head just uh, instead of just sitting there Mm. and just sitting Mm. what would you say the relationship is then between doing the practice and having this experience in like, it seems, it seems like the goal, well, maybe goal is an inappropriate word. Certainly for my Zen practice, I would be whacked with a stick if I used the word goal, (laughs) but, but the, 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 uh, the way you're teaching, it sounds like has to do with the other side of this experience. So mm. it's, it's, it's like you're, you're getting deeper and deeper into this experience in your own practice. Like what is that? 
what is that like in, in relation to that teaching? Oh, um, that was a hard, that was a hard lesson. Um, realizing that the way I was treating my students was, um, to the more difficult students was almost the same way I would treat myself. Mm. And then realizing that, um, and then I would think I would reflect about that, like, oh, sh- why, um, why do I feel the need to impel the way that I think should things should be done into the class? And then having to realize, like, oh, I think this is what I do to myself in my own personal practice. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. Oh, it's it definitely just shows me something about what it's like, which was the question. I think what it leads me to as a next question is about what else has actually it's more like this when you got into yoga you said you mentioned that it was a a, in a recovery process Mm -hmm. were there other spiritual avenues that you were interested in simultaneously or did that come later after years of yoga like astrology has to come in somewhere like what what Mm -hmm. else like accumulated around your practice and how did that support this practice for you? It was actually, yeah, it sort of, um, it actually happened through yoga mm-hmm. at yoga became the stepping stone to other practices. Um, because astrology had, astrology had always been a part of my life, but it was still very much like as I was be- becoming a yoga teacher, it was very, that was just in the background simmering. Um, but it what was so helpful about yoga because i was going through the 12 step program and one of the key things that this 12 step program tries to do is that they 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 reframe one's life and they put to have the person see the substance that it has control over their lives as something that they've made as a higher power mm. so therefore in order to rectify that issue that one must actually have a proper working higher power but the way that the 12 step program is the way that it was written is is in very much um kind of in that in the uh, old school christian mindset mm-hmm. which no, nothing wrong with that absolutely um but for for a lot of people that can be really alienate, alienating for me it wasn't the fact that it was within this christian um within this christian sensibility that was alienating it was more the fact that i just didn't know how to even pursue that and uh, and you know and add along with that like seething self-criticism it was very difficult to actually begin any kind of worthwhile practice so what yoga that's how i begin to see yoga as liter- quite literally a structure to get oneself connected with some new some numinous connection and it's just very simple it's just like sit your ass down sit upright and focus focus on a divine being mm. Very, like just very literally, just that's what it outlines. <laughs> How does it interrelate with other practices for you? Like, like you, you, your your astrological practice into its unto itself, your magical practice. Like, where, what, what are are these all of a piece? Is it all yoga, or or are they adding other dimensions to it? So, in terms of magic, um, one. I actually now practice yoga and sort of the more physical modalities as a way to prepare the body for magical operations. That's, and that's what it's evolved now. Cause before it was sort of like I was doing yoga and then I was getting in back into astrology. Um, because I am, I like, I joined Twitter right around the time I became a yoga teacher. So I was like starting to learn, uh, through astrology, the astrology podcast, learn about, um, Hellenistic and medieval astrology as I'm like becoming a yoga teacher. Then at some point I began to work into magic and then realizing from and learning a lot from my magical teacher Joseph Josephine McCarthy, um, and learning about how m- power moves through the body, so in or- so that the body now plays a really fun- functional role in how I'm able to p- practice magically, and that's where yo- it was like, oh my goodness, I'm already doing this yoga thing, that and it, it just they just dovetailed together perfectly. I feel like there's one more question about that though. Like, are you, you're, you're stuck. You're being a very good occultist and not like saying what that is, but the, the, like <laughs> the, the, sorry, when, when it, let, let me put it this way. When it dovetails, how does it feel in your body? 
I feel it more often when I'm not doing it. 